let's see what happens in chapter 13 and 14. Chapter 13 is Jesus has a code name. I am definitely going to write Zuri Claire a note. For sure. Next week. Yep. Definitely. Next week. Ahem. Ready to rip potato chip? After Joshua died, Israel was a big mess. Everybody pretty much did just what they wanted. The Israelites did a bunch of bad stuff and even started worshiping idols. The Lord put some folks called judges in place to govern Israel. Some judges turned out to be good guys. Others, not so much. When Israel had a good judge and the people followed them, they did okay. But when Israel had a bad judge, everything went sideways. Some judges were sort of good and bad, mixed, like Samson. Right before Samson was born, Jesus showed up and talked to his folks, saying, Your son will belong to God in a special way from the day he's born. Jesus gave his parents very specific instructions. As a sign of the boy's devotion to God, he wasn't supposed to drink wine or ever, ever cut his hair. Now, there's nothing wrong with short hair or long hair in between here, but this was a way to show that Samson was set apart for God to use in a special way. When he grew up, he would become really strong, like superhero strong. Think Superman and the Hulk and Thor. Samson's father, Manoah, asked the angel of the Lord, Remember, that's Jesus. What is your name? When what you've said comes true, we want to give you the credit. Why do you ask my name, Jesus said. It's too wonderful for you to understand. That was kind of a funny response. You'd think this angel of the Lord would have just given his name as Jesus because the specific name Jesus simply means God saves. But Jesus was getting at the fact that the totality of God's name and all his name stands for is so amazing it can't be wholly grasped. That means Jesus' code name is magnificent as an awesome, brilliant, fantastic, phenomenal, gigantic, added Jojo. Breathtaking, said Zuri Claire, and the kids just kept going till we ran out of words. In response to that name, Manoah and his wife offered a sacrifice to the Lord. Flames from the altar shot up to the sky and Jesus ascended in the fire. No special effects. This was real. Samson was born and grew up and did some good things for Israel, mostly by accident while he was trying to get what he wanted. The enemies that were making Israel's life miserable during this time were the Philistines, and they did not like Samson. At all. And the feeling was mutual. Once, Samson caught 300 foxes, tied their tails together in pairs, attached a torch to each pair, and set them loose on the Philistines' fields, right at harvest time. It wasn't very nice to the foxes, but it sure ticked off the enemy. After time, Samson picked up the jawbone of a donkey and killed a thousand enemy soldiers in one fell swoop. Blam! Another time, Samson picked up the city's gate and carried them off on his back. Grrr! The Philistines were so mad, and they tried every which way to kill him. But Samson had a weakness. He liked a woman named Delilah, who wasn't very nice. The Philistines who lived nearby offered Delilah a stack of money to find out the secret of Samson's strength. Delilah tried everything. She nagged and nagged and nagged, but Samson wouldn't tell her. He, tr he tried tricking her, but she kept nagging. Finally, she wore him down, and he told her the truth. Delilah lulled him to sleep with his head in her lap, called a barber, and chopped off his hair, and hollered to his enemies. Samson! Delilah shouted. The Philistines are here! Samson woke up and expected to beat down his enemies like he had done before, but the strength of the Lord had left Samson. Samson. This time he was weak. The Philistines tied him up with ropes, gouged out his eyes to make him blind, and threw him in prison where he was forced to grind grain. Day after day after day. A funny thing happened in prison. I guess Samson had learned his lesson, because as his hair started to grow back, the strength of the Lord returned to him, but nobody knew about it except Samson. One day, the Philistines threw a big party to honor the evil idol. The leader brought out Samson to make fun of him. They'd, forgot, they'd forgotten about his hair, and by now it was pretty long. Samson asked the servant to guide him to the two big pillars that, were suppo that supported the temple roof. Samson pushed hard against the two pillars. The roof collapsed, and all the Philistines in the temple were crushed like bugs under your shoe, along with Samson. In his death, he scored a big victory over the enemies of Israel. So that was Samson, kind of a mixed-up dude, but God still worked through him. Speaking of people getting crushed by falling temples and other violent deaths, we're heading to the story of the fiery furnace built to burn people alive, which isn't cool at all. But something amazing happened in there, and we'll soon find out. Samson's story reminds us to watch out for our weaknesses. Always stay the course, 
makes sure our weaknesses never push us off the path of being devoted to God. See you hipsters next week. Kirby's Notes, stick it inside your brain. Why do you ask my name, the angel of the Lord asked. I am too wonderful for you to understand. Judges chapter 13, verse 8. Want to read more? Judges 13, Hebrews 11, 32 through 40, and Isaiah 9, 6. All right, and chapter 14 is Jesus in flash forward. Man, I must have wrote Zuri Claire 12 million notes and crumpled them all. What am I supposed to say to her? Hi, Kirby here. I think you're smart and funny and nice and cute and blah, blah, blah. She'll just laugh at me. Today she walked into junior church ahead of me, and I said hi again. And she kind of glanced at me like she might say hi back, but just then Aggie walked up and winked. I went red and turned away quick. Gotta go teach. Ahem. <laughs> Fast forward a bunch of years. Israel eventually got kings, and the first king being Saul, a so-so kind of king, who did some good king things and some not-so-great king things. The next king was David. He made a big mistake, but he was also called a man after God's own heart because he was sorry about his mistakes and really wanted to obey God. The prophet Samuel predicted that Jesus would directly descend from King David. King David liked to write poems and stuff, and a bunch of his poems were collected in a book called Psalms. David didn't write all of the Psalms and Psalms, but he wrote a lot of the Psalms and Psalms. So a lot of the Psalms and Psalms are David's Psalms, but not all the Psalms and Psalms are. Say that five times fast. Many psalms refer to Jesus indirectly, talking about Jesus' works or predicting Jesus' coming or how Jesus would die on the cross and come alive again and someday rule the universe. Other than Jesus, David was Israel's greatest king, hands down. But as far as we know, David never had a Christophany, one of those meetings with visible Jesus before he came to earth. But David had lots of God-given knowledge that predicted things about Jesus, and he wrote messianic psalms about him. Okay, vocabulary lesson. Messianic means about the Messiah, and Messiah is one of Jesus' titles. It means anointed one. Some of David's knowledge went way beyond what, how you can ace a math test by studying hard, or even how your mom knows amazing stuff because she has eyes in the back of her head. It could have worked like this. David would be writing a song, and maybe, maybe to play on his harp and sing at the next family dinner. Then something would click, and you'd think, whoa, where did that come from? He'd write and write. And what came out were his own words. But more than that, they were God's words too. David was tuned into a direct channel, getting truth straight from God. Brainy scholars call this inspiration. It's a super cool thing did God did when he gave people the power, using their own thoughts, to write exactly what God wanted written. Sometimes they even wrote things beyond natural thoughts, and brainy scholars call that revelation. A super cool thing God does when he makes known to people things that they could have never discovered on their own. Like when David wrote in Psalm 22, All my bones are out of joint. They have pierced my hands and feet. They divide my garments among themselves and throw dice for my clothing. David's not talking about himself. He went through tough stuff, but nothing like that. He was exactly describing what Jesus would go through many years in the future. Jesus' bones were thrown out of joint from the crucifixion torture and his hands and feet were pierced with nails as they hammered him onto the cross. Then those soldiers played a silly gambling game to see who'd get Jesus' clothes. God revealed those exact details to David hundreds of years before. David was just one Bible writer who explained writing down, who experienced writing down exactly what God wanted written. The New Testament explains, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. Grandpa McCook, shining his glasses on his shirt tail and leaning forward in his recliner, grinned and said, Yep, that's why we're so crazy about the Bible. It's God's very own words. King David's son Solomon came next as king of Israel. Solomon started out wise. God gave him a wise and understanding heart such as no one else had ever had or ever will have. But as years went on, not so much. Like, one dumb thing he did was marry hundreds and hundreds of wives, all at the same time. I mean, how are you ever going to give a romantic dinner just to 701 of you? Even worse, almost all of Solomon's wives worshipped idols, and as the years went by, Solomon started worshipping idols too. Dumb. Big dummy doing dumb things. When people start worshipping idols, that's pretty much the end of the good times for the nation of Israel. Things crumbled fast. After Solomon died, his son took over and the nation split in two. 
a bunch of different kings ruled over the next years, some good, but some rotten. The next two kingdoms were called Israel and Judah, and eventually both of them got conquered. Israel fell to Assyria in 722 BC, and Judah fell to Babylon in 586 BC. People from Israel were forced to march to Assyria, and people from Judah were hauled off to Babylon. But God didn't desert them. He showed up even in their exile, as we'll see next week. Kirby's notes stick inside your brain. All scripture is inspired by God and used to teach us what is true and make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. 2 Timothy 3.16 Want to read more? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 20 and 21, Psalm 22, verses 1 through 18, and Isaiah 53. See you tomorrow!